Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. So last class, we're talking about how psychology is different from, from pseudoscience, how science is, is different from pseudoscience. And when I was uh, cleaning my room, my office, uh, yesterday, I, I found something. And, and it's my notes from, from a psychic reading that I got in, in 2013, so 10 years ago now. And, and what did the psychic say? I, I wrote that uh, she had been dressed in sort of orange robes. She was wearing a lot of necklaces and, and rings. And we were in a, a, a room with you know, candles and props. And then she was swooping around. Um, it was quite fun, actually. Anyway, so she said that uh, that she saw that I was surrounded by by blue angels and that I was doing a lot of work and so that I had I had low energy and that I should therefore keep lots of crystals around me to to keep my energy up. Could be a good way to sell crystals. And uh, what did she say? She said that I had a humanitarian impact, that I do a lot for people and the uh, higher spirit notices. And then she made a prediction. She said that she saw a new article of clothing or shoes coming for me next month and that she hoped that, that I'd enjoy it. Is that a good prediction? I mean, I think it's a good prediction because it's perfectly vague. Um, uh, Mika, your uh, your connection it came through very distorted, but I think I I got that it was vague. Yeah, so it's it's so vague that it it's. It'll catch so many different events. Like, what's the chance that somebody is going to buy new clothing in in the next month in our capitalist society is like it's pretty high. So that's called a base rate, and they, they mentioned that in chapter two, I believe, of your text. So the base rate of getting new new stuff um, is quite high. And if I wanted it to be true, it would be so easy for me to like, you know see something I like and be like, oh, but the psychic predicted that I'd be getting a new thing. So maybe I'm supposed to buy this. Right. So I could easily enter into that game and and make it true. Um, yeah. So is it a good prediction or a bad prediction? It's sort of an effective prediction in the sense that it's it's going to be it's going to be right or it's highly likely to to end up being right. But it's not a useful having that type of prediction isn't useful for making predictions in a complex world when we don't want to just rely on uh, being able to say that something something is going to happen is, is about to happen. It's kind of like if I were like, tomorrow you will get dressed and eat breakfast. I see this in your future. Um, I'd be right, but it's like minimally useful. Um, and what else did she say? She said, um, you will be asked to do something this week and that I should take a leadership role. Again, the chance that somebody would ask me to do something in a week would be pretty high, right? High base rate. And uh, well, if I do something, is that right? If I take the action, if I go forward with it, is that taking a leadership role? And, you know, uh, maybe maybe that would work out. She said, you have a lot of skills and knowledge and you could find a career doing that. But she didn't say what the skills and knowledge were and what what the career would be. But, you know, sitting there, I could probably think, oh, yeah, I'm good at X and I could get a career doing X. And it kind of it, it leaves it leaves it with me. Right. So if, if you're getting getting a reading from a psychic, you're doing a lot of the reading yourself. Right. They're not just reading you. They're, they're saying something might be cryptic or vague and then you're kind of providing the rest. And that's that's one reason it might work. And then, um, as you know, I, I have a I have a chiropractor, so I, I dabble in, in pseudoscience a little, uh, but I know uh, that it's not going. Could be right. It can be misapplied. Uh, I have a friend who uh, who's into aromatherapy, and we went to this um, kind of a it was called a, a wellness center, 
And what I learned from her is, is that apparently your nose, if you blend scents together, uh, don't mix more than three because then it's too hard to pick out what the different essential oils are. So I made a one for like being stressed at work um, and it contains black pepper because when you're sort of, there's, there's an intensity of, of suffering through something. Uh, the, the noun passion means to suffer. So that's like stressed at work, the passion, pepper. And then the other one was black spruce for those times when you feel lost in the dark woods. And the other one was wild orange because, you know, if you if you go through with something, you find gifts along the way. And so when I have that overwhelming feeling of stress, I'll sort of sniff it and and try to pick out, be like, oh, there's there's the pepper and uh, and there's the the black spruce and, and there's the orange. And it actually is very grounding because it takes me out of my head and whatever I'm thinking about and sort of back into the real world, which includes this this scent. And I don't feel like I need a, a randomized control trial to tell me that works for me. And uh, I don't think there's there's much any harm in, in me having this and only cost about $11. But if somebody were to tell me that sniffing this would cure my diabetes because of a certain blend of essential oils, and if I were to believe that and stop taking my insulin, then you know I'd be in a lot of trouble. All right, so last class we were on the, you know, what is psychology and what is the psyche and who is psyche and the story of psyche. And we we talked about her first trial where she had to sort out the, um, was it the basket of grains? But but the ants helped her and they broke the task into, into lots of little pieces. And and now we're on to to her second trial. So Psyche's second trial was to collect golden fleece from the sun god's vicious flock of rams. Very aggressive and dangerous. How's she going to get the fleece? And this time she was helped by the water reeds who whispered advice to her. And, and that's how inspiration shows up in ancient Greek myths. Like, oh, the, the god of something's going to give you some, some advice. I can't remember which one it was. And, and so you know, he'll speak to her through through the water reeds. And um, in, in classical times, masculinity was seen as dominant and femininity was seen as submissive. And so Psyche is the hero, but uh, she has to be appropriately submissive. And so she gets all her advice from these male characters. So she can't have the idea herself but the, you know, the idea will come to her whispered through a water reed from, from the male gods. You see that kind of happening. So rather than confront the aggressive rams, she's, she's told to wait until the end of the day and then collect the fleece from the bushes and trees where the rams had passed by. Clever. And so it's like as, as water will find its way downhill, kind of flowing around obstacles. So, so Psyche was like that, too. Instead of cr confronting the issue directly, she used prudence and, and wisdom to get around the obstacle in order to complete the trial. Psyche's third trial was to collect a flask of water from a high and dangerous mountain that was guarded by dragons. Her helper this time was an eagle who offered to fill the flask for her. And there are many ways to interpret myths, and I'm doing that with, you know, from the modern period. I might not be reading it the same way somebody would, you know, a thousand years ago. But it's been speculated that the eagle represents perspective of taking the long view and looking at the wider design before deciding how to best, how most efficiently and effectively solve a problem. And I'll notice that Psyche also has a lot of wardrobe malfunctions. Her final trial was the most difficult one. So she was to steal some of the beauty from Persephone, the queen of hell, and bring it back to Aphrodite in a box. And she's been strongly cautioned by her advisors, she always has, not to look in the box. And Psyche's trials started after she went along with some bad counsel. She said yes when she should have said no. And the story comes full circle because in order to get 
through the underworld. She has to stay very focused and strategic and, and say no to any distractions and temptations. Keep her eyes on the road, and there are many. Of course, at the end, she screws it up. She succumbs to her natural curiosity and opens the box that she was told not to look into. But instead of beauty, it contained death. And so she falls into a seemingly eternal slumber. But she put in such a good effort that she's ultimately redeemed through her trials. So Eros, also known as Cupid, who's been watching the whole time, forgives her. And she's rescued by a kiss. The gods of Olympus take pity on her. And they give her the drink of ambrosia, which makes her immortal. And so Psyche is the ancient Greek or Roman goddess of the soul. The wedding of Eros and Psyche, of Cupid and Anima, is one of the few happy endings in classical mythology. So that, that romance is now legitimized. Okay? So there's a big theme of social order. Uh, Jupiter, or in, uh, in the Roman, he'd be Zeus, uh, he presides over the feast, as, as he's supposed to. And all the gods are sitting in their proper place at the table and getting along with each other. And they're all doing what they're supposed to do, following the natural order of things. So the muses are playing the music. And Vulcan, the god of fire, is cooking the food. Dionysus, the god of wine, served the wine. And so the, the wedding is a triumph of ideals and order according to the values of classical antiquity. You might have different values now. So Cupid and Psyche live happily ever after, and they have a daughter named Hedony, and that means pleasure, enjoyment, and delight. And that word will come up for you again if you keep studying psychology and well-being, because the major moral philosophy behind the concept of well-being is hedonic well-being. It's, it's not something that's seen well by moral philosophers, but it, there's still a lot of it in psychology. And so the idea that um, well-being is pleasure and, and not experiencing pain or suffering. And so why... Let's look at some of the main themes of, of the story. So it's, it's essentially a, a story of, of the soul's passage. So it's about this person's journey from unconscious innocence to conscious wisdom through a process of loss and trials and tri tribulations. And Sigmund, we won't talk about it really in this class, but maybe you will in if you continue psychology, you'd study the ideas of Freud. And he was very influenced by Greek myths. If you learn about the Oedipus complex. And um, he had this view of personality development as coming from these unconscious conflicts that need to be resolved. And, and Psyche's redemption is, is found in that she's living earnestly and she's trying to do the right thing, but she's human and she never stops running into trouble or making mistakes or being tortured by one thing or another. She does go astray, but she remains faithful to her ideals. And that's why she can pick herself up and keep going. She gets through all of her trials with help from, from others. So there's a theme of, of grace, which is an idea of you know, help from outside. Like you feel like you are this big and the challenge you're con confronting is, is that big. But somehow you make up the difference. And maybe you don't. Maybe other people help you. Right? So often you feel alone, but you're really not. You live in community. And sure, you might make some enemies, but you also have your friends and your allies. And sometimes they're ones that you weren't expecting that, that show up for you at the last moment. And so other people have been through similar trials to you, and they can give you advice and perspective and support. And, and providing that kind of guidance and perspective is one of the roles of psychologists or counselors. And so this story gets into that sort of more narrative and, and artistic side of psychology. And it's a side you'll find more of in social and personality psychology. Um, that's kind of not the, 
the subject of this this course, which is the biological side of psychology. But I think we need to remember that psychology is a crossover discipline between biology and philosophy, and and you never get away from the philosophy. Because even if you're you're talking about neurotransmitters and you know well being, well, what's your philosophy of of well being? I think it's it's also important to always remember that we have that social and cultural lens, and the cultural lens is steeped in in mythology, both modern and and old mythology. So we have these, you know, ideas that that come to us from you know two thousand years ago. And you know, what's what's a modern myth? I'd identify one as as say passion. That uh, you have a passion, you can identify your passion, pursue that, uh, no matter what, and then then you will be happy and, and productive. That's that's a myth. We just kind of believe myths and and go along with them without questioning them critically or asking, you know, where did they come from and and who 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 does this work for and and does it work for you? So psychology is originally this sort of study of of the the philosophical study of the soul, and the person who broke the discipline away into being a modern science was Wilhelm Wundt. And he redefined its study as consciousness. So instead of soul, we're now talking about consciousness, right, as, as the mind. He was the first person to call himself a psychologist and he had a psychology lab where he studied things like, say, reaction times. So psychology is ultimately about understanding and explaining and predicting human behavior. And there are a number of schools of thought that have shaped modern psychology. And we'll talk about sort of the, the five mainstream ones. There are others outside of this as well. Uh, let's, let's talk about the ones in your textbook. So Structuralism was an attempt to understand the elements of the mind. Okay, so now we're th we're thinking about consciousness as the mind, right? things you're aware of, and you could say, well, what kind of things can you be aware of? Let's say, um, uh, imagine a rose. I could look at this rose and and say, well, there's uh, it, it's it's pink. So seeing color is an element of the mind. Um, well, it has a, a, a soft texture. Well, OK, um, feeling texture is an element of the mind. Oh, no, I got stabbed by a thorn. Feeling pain is an element of the mind. It, it smells nice. Scent is an element of the mind. And the structuralist wanted to find all these elements kind of like the, the chemists have a periodic table of elements. We'd, we'd have something like that. Then the functionalists asked, well, you know, what, what is that for? So let's say an element of your mind is the, abil the ability to smell. What, what good does that do you? And you could say that it helps you identify what food is good and, and what food is bad. And that one connects to evolutionary psychology, which would would ask, you know, how is this behavior, how could it have been adaptive over the, the history of our species? How could these behaviors have been selected for? The behaviorists wanted to make psychology a really objective science, right? Take all this philosophy away. And they thought that psychology should just focus on external observable behavior. So if you smile, I can see you do that. And my research assistants can see you do that too. And we can count the number of smiles. And, and they wanted psychology to be based on, on that kind of objective data. Now, in reality, you still need operational definitions because, you know, what, you know, how hard do you have to smile in order for it to be coded as a smile? Like maybe there's a, you know, 
a slight smirk that um, I would count as a smile that, that my research assistant wouldn't. And, and that gets into something we'll talk about in, in chapter two called inter-rater reliability. But for now, the idea of behaviorism is to, to be that super objective science that doesn't care what you think. You don't, I don't need to know if you're happy or not. I'm just seeing whether you're smiling and maybe there's something I can do that would make you smile because I want to control that behavior for some reason. Cognitivists, sorry, behaviorism is, is limited because, well, it wants to use rewards and punishments to control your behavior. Right? They did a lot of research on, on learning and, well, the name Pavlov might, might ring a bell for you. What did, what did Pavlov do? Does anyone know? Um. Um, was he um, in like in charge of like conditioning, like classical conditioning and whatnot? And what did what did he do? What was he sort of famous for? Um, didn't he condition dogs with the bell and feeding time? So he, then they heard the bell, they automatically associated it with food. Isn't that kind of what he did? Yeah, so normally a dog would not salivate to a, a bell. It was actually a tone, but uh, because of a mistranslation from the Russian, we call it a bell. So let's go with bell. Normally, uh, what would a, it, it, I don't know if any of you have dogs, but if you just rang a, a bell, what, what would your dog do? Wouldn't they just bark? Yeah, or, or maybe turn and look at it, but they wouldn't salivate because that's not what they're biologically primed to do. Food, they will definitely salivate for. So uh, just as you guys suggested, what, what Pavlov did was he, he paired the tone with, with food. So let's ring the bell and then offer food. And the reason he started this experiment was that... Um, he he knew that dogs are supposed to salivate to food, but he noticed that when sort of the, the researcher assistants were coming to feed the dogs and the dogs could hear them coming down the hallway, they could hear their boots in the hallway, and the dogs started salivating like crazy. And he's like, what's going on? So they didn't smell the food yet. Well, maybe they could, they're dogs. Um, but he was thinking they shouldn't be salivating to the sound of boots in the hallway but it was something that was paired with, with being fed. And so he did this experiment with, um, with the tone. And so he sounds the tone and then presents the food. And you do enough of those pairing pairings, the dog learns that the tone is a predictor of, of the food. And the dog will, after, let's say, uh, 20 of these pairings, you sound the bell and the dog salivates. So there's a learned association. Um, and, and that was a very sort of scientific study because you had research assistants collecting the dog's drool. And you could say, oh, OK, after this many pairings, there's this many milliliters of, of drool. So then there was um, operant conditioning. It's another kind of condition. Does anyone know what, what operant conditioning is? Going from classical conditioning to operant conditioning. It's not normal for a rat to press a lever, except maybe accidentally out of curiosity, if you put it in a little cage and there's absolutely nothing else to do, maybe it'll put its paw on it haphazardly. But what if every time the rat did that, a pellet came out and it's a hungry rat? What might the rat start doing over time? Wouldn't he start pressing the lever and learn yeah. that the lever meant food? Mm -hmm. So the, the rat maybe doesn't totally get it the first time, but the second time that happens, then the rat gets it and starts, starts going for it. And 
Another thing that an experimenter might do is pair the lever press with a foot shock. So the rat presses the lever and a, an electric shock is delivered to the uh, floor of the cage. It's not, not a very nice feeling. And then maybe the rat's not going to do that again. And so you decrease the frequency of the behavior. And the idea there is that uh, the, the behavior is had is that we don't need to care what you're thinking. You just to sort of have these, there's a biological drive for food, there's a, a drive for safety, and we'll just manipulate those in order to control your behavior. But we, we run into problems, especially with um, more complicated species like, like humans. Is a grade of B on your test a reward or a punishment? If you don't care, right, it kind of doesn't matter. But let's say you're uh, really hung up about academic performance and you really, really care and you're used to getting A's. Well, then a B might feel like a slap in the face and you'd experience that as a punishment. But let's say that you've been, you know, struggling academically or you have a lot going on in your life. You have very little time to study and, and you thought you were going to fail that midterm. And you got a B. Well, then the B's are a reward. So, in fact, your interpretations do matter. And, and that judgment, uh, that interpretation is something that happens in your head, right? In the black box of, of your head. So we have to get in there. So cognitivists want, want to get in that black box and they want to know what you're thinking and, and how are you thinking about that? And how does that change as, as you develop? Because children might not think about things the same way as adults. And then um, in order to study something like memory for anything more complicated than classical or operant conditioning, we, we, have, to, we have to get into cognitive psychology. Um, there's some names there, and I assume, I haven't read the whole book yet, but I assume these will come up later. Uh, Jean Piaget studied how, how develop, uh, sorry, how thinking develops in children. So how does a three-year-old think versus a five-year-old versus a 12-year-old? Children who are less than about I don't know, 12-ish at the stage of formal operations, according to Piaget, don't think in, in abstract ways. Before that, they're, they're concrete thinkers. Um, then there's the, the lens of, of psychoanalysis, and this is the one that's, that, that's getting into this idea of, of an unconscious mind. I find the, the, the term unconscious mind very paradoxical because, well, Mind was supposed to mean consciousness. If you think of the, the word mind and how we use it, it, it gets at the idea of awareness. So if I say, um, you know, I really mind that the students are talking about test answers, then it sort of says that it bothers me, right? I'm aware of it. If I say, you know, I don't mind if students come to lecture, then it's like, you know, I'm kind of not really noticing whether you're coming or not. In, in the subway station in London, there's there's all these signs that say mind the gap because they don't want you to fall in this space um, before you get get off the get onto the platform. And so if you're minding the gap, then you're being consciously aware, oh, there's a gap there and I'm going to step over it. So the idea of unconscious mind is a bit odd to me. But there is plenty of evidence that there is, in fact, an unconscious mind. So you have a conscious mind that's focusing on something. So right now, maybe you're focusing on, on what I'm saying, but your body is still doing other things, right? If, um, if there were to be a noise outside that was different, right, you would notice, which means you were aware that it wasn't there before. There's plenty of evidence there is in fact an unconscious mind. And Freud was the first psychologist to start thinking about it. Actually, Freud wasn't really a psychologist. He was, uh, he was a medical doctor and he was a neuroscientist. 
So Freud thought that your personality develops from these um, unconscious complexes that relate to unresolved childhood issues. And I don't think we need to get into it, but his his idea would be like, okay, let's say you have some anxiety, you're neurotic. Well, maybe that has something to do with um, the way your mother toilet trained you. And we need to sort of talk about that so that you can resolve the conflict and, and then be free of it. Carl Jung was um, very much into an artistic, symbolic side of psychology. And uh, Carl Jung might have argued, and he looked at things like, like myths as, as well. And he considered many myths from across the world. And he thought that there was a, kind of a, a typical story arc um, the story of Psyche has a story arc that comes up a lot in, in many different stories. And I saw someone say in the chat, well, you know, isn't that like the Golden Fleece story? Well, there's actually a, a lot of overlap between, between these, these cultural narratives. And there's a, a general or a very common arc is that at first things are, are well, are, are good. But then something happens and, you know, there's a call for you to go out on the journey or you just get kicked out of the garden and you're on the journey. And then you have to go through sort of trials and, and tribulations and, you know, you find your allies and you have to confront something head on at some point. Right. And then you at the end of the story kind of come back to the point of origin. So let's say. Um, Psyche goes back to uh, Cupid or Frodo comes back to the Shire. Uh, but, but even if you're coming back to the same place, you have changed from having been through that journey. Imagine if like, let's say you were bullied um, at school and the playground was kind of a, a traumatic space for you. And now, you know, you've gone up, you've grown up and, and you come and you walk back into that playground. And it's the same playground, but yet you see it differently because you're bigger and, and you've changed, that kind of thing. Um, and Carl Jung also thought that there were characters that kind of popped up in these in, in these stories, that one character is, is like the hero that uses skills um, in a way that is courageous in order to, to leave a mark on the world. And then may, maybe another kind of character that, that comes up is like a, a mother figure. Uh, maybe, ah, I, I hear a baby. Hello, baby. So, um, could you just all mute your microphones? I don't know how to do that. So Carl Jung thought there were about 12 of these archetypes. And, and you could ask yourself, well, how am I like one of these, these archetypes? Um, I want to draw attention to the way the history of psychology has been presented to you, because history is a story. And one way of thinking about stories is that they aren't really true or false. They're they're partly true, they, they contain facts, and there's also like a, a role for spin and exaggeration. And we focus on some facts and then we might disregard the others. And then we, we pull up themes and present the story in a certain way. But there could be different ways of, of looking at that data. So I wanna draw attention to the, the way we've presented this in the, this great man view. Right, that there are these five disciplines and that there's a founding father of the discipline, that there's there's one great man, an intellectual giant, and the discipline is the, the seed of his mind and its practitioners are all his intellectual descendants. That's a perspective. It's one you find pretty much in all the mainstream psych textbook. It's, it's a way of framing things. And um, it's fairly patriarchal. It reflects uh, historical conditions in, you know, the 1850s or the 
80s when, you know, women couldn't attend university or graduate with degrees. So it sort of makes sense that the people that were writing the psychology textbooks were, were men. Uh, but in practice, uh, there are often many people or a few people who independently have similar ideas at similar times. Um, large projects are not usually the work of one person. There's a, a team. And if you were to really dig into the history of the discipline of the ideas, if you were to really ask who contributed, um, you would find that there are people who made major contributions, but who were simply unrecognized and, and written out of the narrative. So on the last slide, you saw that John Watson is the leading figure for behaviorism. Well, they didn't mention Rosalie Rayner his graduate student and later his wife, she had a tremendous amount to do with his research. And that's a picture of, of her there, one of her his most famous studies. Getting credit for work in academia isn't just about who did the work, right? It's, there's a big power game about around getting credit and fame and recognition and status. And there are many people who do the work and have the ideas and, and actually don't get proportional credit, maybe because they're low status research assistants or graduate students who depend on a supervisor and maybe the supervisor wants the credit and has the power. So academia is very hierarchical and um, I find the culture has a difficult time understanding or adapting to the fact that projects are done by teams and, you know, they're it doesn't make a lot of sense from the perspective of organizational psychology to to talk about one person on a team like the most valuable player like that's not how good teams work but the academic system is sort of structured in a way that that, that likes those hierarchies it's, it's part of the way we do things and and the first author is the most important author who gets the most career awards and so that first author is is a coveted place and people will fight for that even unethically and i've i mean i've seen it end relationships so that's my academic culture moment so what can we take away from from these major fields so one of the big uh, contributions of structuralism was this systematic approach to collecting data, trying to be comprehensive, trying to be systematic. Um, functionalism um, appeals to to evolutionary theory and in asking, well, you know, if, if there's a certain state or a trait, how is this adaptive? Um, evolutionary theory is one of those those big unifying theories that you know can't be proven. You can always come up with a story about how something is adaptive in the long run evolutionary game. And it's a way of of looking at things and understanding things, but it's it's not, I don't know, evolutionary psychology stories are are just so stories. You could always come up with with a different one, and there's no way to prove it. But it's a you know, it's a unifying theory. Um Behaviorism tried to be very scientifically rigorous. It certainly contributed a great deal to, to the study of learning. Um, cognitivism focused on our interpretations of events and the big contribution of, of psychodynamics is uh, I think that that slide should, which came from the textbook publisher really should have said psychodynamics because psychoanalysis is actually a tool that, that you use. Um, but psychodynamics dynamics was about the unconscious mind. And even though Freud's theories were pretty wacky, he was definitely on to something. So there are many different kinds of, of psychologists, more even than than are listed in your textbook. And, I, and I'm wondering, like, it, are there any of, of you folks who are in this class because you want to be a psychologist? and you know, what kind of psychologist do you want to be? Does anyone want to be a psychologist? So one for, for clinical psychologists. When we say psychologist, most people think clinical psychologist. Most people think that, I'd say a, a common lay 
perspective on psychology is that psychologists are clinical psychologists. Okay, so, and I saw quite a few in the chat, quite a few folks want to be a clinical psychologist, and there's an educational psychologist as well. Um, I see someone wants to be a criminal or child psychologist. Those are sub-disciplines of clinical psychology. So you could be a clinical psychologist that focuses on children or a clinical psychologist that focuses on forensic populations. Okay, so, so far I'm seeing that, that most folks are interested in, in being a clinical psychologist. That's actually very, um, very common, like in, in first year, because there's a, a sort of cultural idea that, that all psychologists are clinical psychologists. And, uh, but sometimes when people say that they want to be a clinical psychologist, what they really mean is they want to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about their issues. And clinical psychology is one, one path to that. Clinical psychology programs are very selective. Um, they admit about 3% of applicants. And uh, base research from a colleague of mine at Queen's, um, she's an undergraduate program coordinator there in, in psychology, about half the students in, in her classes will say they want to be a clinical psychologist. So in, in practice, that, that may, may be a fit for you. I think it's always best to think about like what what work do you want to do? So a question that I'll ask students is like, okay, tell me about your, you know, your job down the road. Like, where are you? Right? What What is the setting? What kind of room are you in? Are you in a hospital? Are you in a school? Are you in a university? Are you in a workplace? Right? Are you talking to a, a manager? Are you talking to a group of people? Are you talking about a person who's upset? Is it a person who is uh, sort of high social status or a person who's low social status? And so sometimes, like, I'll, I'll try to get that image of, of what work the person wants to do and then, then work backwards from, from the type of psychology. So clinical psychologists diagnose, assess, and treat people with mental disorders. So they use a medical model to understand well-being, but there's probably a bigger focus on, on ill-being. And they often act within a, a health services model. So a clinical psychologist can bill an insurance company. So many people have, you know, because they're students or because they're working, have like a group health insurance plan. And there's some coverage for psychological services. I know that um, my student plan has covers uh, $1,000, which is about five sessions, I think. In Nova Scotia, the going rate for clinical psychologists is about $250 an hour. So maybe it's something like four sessions. Um, clinical psychologists uh, tend to see patients who have more severely dysfunctional behavior or those um, from uh, vulnerable populations like children or people who are uh, institutionalized, hospitalized, incarcerated. And that's often, that's like a requirement of the system. So if the hospital is hiring a psychologist, they require that you be a clinical psychologist. So I think that if you're interested in clinical psychology, good to learn a lot about systems and how they work. Um, clinical psychologists also see private practice clients, but because of the high rates, those tend to be wealthier folks. So Sigmund Freud based his theories of psychology on, um, you know, wealthy Viennese women who were coming to see him with, with say, anxiety. So he's making generalizations about all women based on a very small sample of wealthy white women. Um, the different fields of psychology express different political values. Um, counseling has uh, runs libertarian, and I would say that um, clinical psychology runs sort of conservative or authoritarian. So there's a relationship between the practitioner and the user of the services that we would call kind of like, a, it's like a doctor-patient relationship, right? The person is, is a patient with, with an illness and they're receiving treatment from Dr. So-and-so. 
Okay, that's a certain kind of relationship. And a medical model is one lens for, for looking at, at behavior. Um, clinical psychologists are, are limited in the sense that they're not medical doctors, right? If, they're, if you're saying that something is an illness and maybe it would respond to a medical treatment, you're not a psychiatrist, right? The kind of doctor that can prescribe a medication for a mental illness is the psychiatrist. Even if your doctor so-and-so is a clinical psychologist, you're a doctor of philosophy and your treatment is essentially a sort of philosophical, right? You're, you're talking about things and uh, maybe getting different perspectives on, on an idea. Um, counseling is, um, the textbook describes it as for those experiencing temporary or situational problems. Well, what problems aren't situational? So counseling, counselors have um, use more of a social model. So that's a different lens that you can look at things. And they, they're interested in um, adjustment. So what are you doing to adjust your environment? Is there some skill you can learn? Or maybe do we need to, to change something about the environment? Uh, yes, Calvin. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello. Um, I just got a question to ask you. Yeah. I wanted to ask, why do you, like you're talking about um, kind of like the, like authoritarianism, conservatism, stuff like that, and um, kind of psychology. Why do you think that there is a push, at least right now in Canada, to go and focus more on like mad, uh, made services, so like medical assisted dying as compared, kind of like for veterans, people with PTSD, um, as compared to going and having them like have actual proper treatment with like clinical psychologists or counseling? So that's like an issue that's been raised by a lot of veterans groups in the past year. So like there's like been like 10,000 people yeah. that have had medical assisted dying. I just want to know your thoughts or opinions. Fascinating. I'm not aware of that at all. I basically don't read the news because I have five email box inboxes and I just, my goal is to answer all my email every day. So I basically don't know what's going on in the world. Um, I realized that there was a global pandemic when I started seeing these really weird signs at the university, like don't drink the water. I'm like, what's going on? And, and then somebody told me about COVID because I wasn't reading reading the news and all these people wearing masks. I was like, what the hell? Um, so uh, interesting question and, and um, I don't know the answer, um, but I would say that what's a bit more authoritarian in clinical psychologists is the idea that certain behaviors are illnesses and there is like a, a book, well, it's not the behavior that's an illness, the, the mental illness is a, a label that goes onto a, um, a cluster of behaviors. And, and then there's kind of, it's stripped of social context. And then you sort of say, well, this is the, the big book of, of mental illness. It's like the, it's called the, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And I'm the expert and I have my colleagues who are experts and we're registered and you're the patient and we'll give you treatment. But that's kind of more of a, that's a relationship of, there's a power difference there, right? There's a relationship of dominance and submission. And I think it's probably appropriate in some contexts. And you have to think about, well, you know, what kind of work do you want to do with with what kind of client and what kind of situation? Um, so counseling, notice how I highlighted the word patient and client. If you're a counselor, you don't call that person a patient. Um, so they use more of a, a social or environmental model. There's a very strong social justice orientation that goes back to the founding of the discipline. So if, if you're looking for something that's really woke, um, then I would say that counseling is probably a better fit than clinical psychology. Um, they will work with kind of underserved populations that can't pay as well, and they will learn earn lower incomes in doing so. So how much money you earn as a psychologist also depends on the kind of client you're serving. So the highest paid psychologists ever are IO psychologists. They don't even seek registration, right? They're not licensed psychologists because management doesn't care, right? They work for corporate management typically. Um, and then if you have wealthy private practice clients or there's a system that can, can pay you, um, then you can earn more. But if you're working with um, indigenous communities where there is an issue with alcohol use disorders, well, you, you might not earn as much, but, but you might do that work for, for different reasons. And uh, the political values of the field tend to be more sort of left, more liberal, more liber libertarian. So they don't seek registration. So in order to get registered as a psychologist, there's a lot of hoops to jump through and you have to do things a certain way in a way that a body of people with power approve of. And um, some some folks don't want to deal with that or they they don't like that system. And so you can practice in Nova Scotia. I'm not sure about you're in a different 
in a different province and and these licensing depends on jurisdiction and um, you can call yourself a counselor without jumping through those those hoops um but then some counselors wanted to be able to bill insurance companies and so even though counseling traditionally does not use a medical model that has crept in since the 1970s and so now there's a designation called registered counseling therapist that you know applies that medical model for therapy so that you can bill the insurance company there are school psychologists right who work um, in schools with teachers and with parents and children um, to help students adjust to the classroom can address behavior issues school psychology is not the same thing as educational psychology um, educational psychologists are more about kind of research and policy development there are developmental psychologists often they're clinical psychologists they don't have to be they can be experimental psychologists um, who work um, According to your book, they say work with infants and children and examine how people change over time. But there are also developmental psychologists that study um, uh, elderly populations. So it doesn't have to be children. It could be teenagers as well. Um, experimental psychologists will use those controlled laboratory experiments to study, well, many different things. They can study social psychology with those experiments. You can study... Um, memory your language and they tend to be academics so university professors with with labs there are bio biopsychologists who study the physiological basis of behavior they would want to know well in in this phenomenon well what what neurotransmitter systems are active what what parts of the brain are active some of you folks uh, are interested in being forensic psychologists so forensic psychologists are often clinical psychologists and they um help with you know with assessment diagnosis or rehabilitation of um, folks who are incarcerated and then they also do research on things like like eyewitness testimony there, there are a lot of things about human memory that um, make it highly subject to bias a lot of us trust our memories as if they were a videotape no 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 um, every time you pull up your memory it's like you edit the file and then you save it again okay, our, our memories are quite heavily constructed and that's a problem if everyone in, in the wit in the, in the jury box thinks that what the person what the eyewitness is saying is exactly what happens but there's there's a very strong bias to believe people's eyewitness testimony so forensic psychologists can can help there um According to your, your textbook, um, industrial organizational psychologists help select employees and would design equipment for maximum productivity. I'd say those are a couple of things that IO psychologists do. There, there's a whole lot more, like they can help with goal setting, with um, teamwork, with occupational health and safety, with organizational development. And they are the highest paid psychologists and they operate without registration. And so they'd use the term consultant or executive coach. What's really important to understand is the relationship with, with management. So they are psychologists who work for managers. And uh, that, is, that is my field. And um, hmm. I would say that when I was hired as a coach, it was not really to help the employee, right? It was probably more to help the manager control the employee. So you have to think about who your client is and who you want your client to be. I'm aware that we're over time, but since I'm recording and I'm almost done, I'm just going to keep going and, and wrap up and you guys can, can catch the, the end of the recording if you can't stay. There are still many other fields that, that are not mentioned at all. So there's critical psychology. Critical psychologists would apply the tool of critical theory to dismantle an idea to see where power relationships lie. There are liberation psychologists that try to take the perspective of the um, lower powered group and try to understand their perspective and how systems affect them and how people can disentangle themselves from, from systems that let's say are oppressing them in some way. Psychology, when it's trying to be really scientific, takes this modernist, positivist perspective that, you know, we are the, we're studying global universal human behavior. But really, 
psychologists are often a small group of very class privileged people who work in a context where they're doing research on undergraduates who are also class privileged and um, above average intelligence and overwhelmingly white. And then so 75 percent of psychology research papers are based on undergraduates like you folks who are not a representative sample. And then we speak um, as if the, these were some kind of like universal truths without recognizing that they're really contextual and, uh, you know, maybe they don't generalize beyond our place in time and history or place geographically or demographically. But there are indigenous psychologies. And so an indigenous psychology is one that is kind of developed from and for a, a certain local group. So their Native Americans can have um, their own sort of psychology. And so can people in South Africa and so can can Latin Americans. And they would study concepts that we don't even recognize in mainstream psychology because in psychology, we study philosophical social constructs and those differ based on social context. So there's there's still even more. There's religion psychologists, so traffic psychologists, and food psychologists. So there's there's lots of options for you guys. Um, if you're wondering what kind of psychologist I am, I'm, I'm a vocational psychologist, and that's the study of career and career development. It's the original form of counseling psychology, and it's an applied arm. It's applied practice is career counseling, and the the different disciplines kind of have different goals. And so the the mission, if you please, of vocational psychology is decent work for all. IO psychology is like, you know, how far can you climb the corporate ladder of success? But a vocational psychologist would say, um, maybe we're trying to aim at a world where everyone has access to work and safe work. And decent work means that you're not like picking through syringes with, with no gloves or being pushed into the sex trade. Um, and that everyone should be able to sort of access that, like work that, you know, works with your values. So if you're Muslim, you shouldn't be uh, forced to work in a factory with, you know, greasing things with pork fat. That's kind of idea. So um, it's more about bringing the bottom up than getting an individual to the very top. And so you could ask, well, what is what does career mean? And a lot of people think of career from a management perspective. And so corporate management would look at your career as, um, your job in that organization from the time that you were recruited to the time that, that you're fired or retired or quit. But from vocational psychology, career means something very different. It's the constellation of your public social roles across your life course. So right now, your career is happening now, and now you're in the student role. And that's a public social role because there's expectations for what a student's supposed to do. And right now I'm in a, a work role as an instructor and there's expectations about what I do. I run a lecture, I don't sort of start dancing on the table. But there's even other public social roles. So maybe you have a, a, a hobby, maybe you do martial arts, maybe you do judo and, and you go to a, a dojo and there's expectations there. And most of us are hand, juggling like two or three of those at a time. And so you can think of those roles as bands of a rainbow. And then the arc of the rainbow gets at the idea that there's sort of different phases in life. So at one point, you're sort of a child and you're doing what you're told and people are making decisions for you. And then um, the phase that many of you are in now are, is, is an exploration phase where you're like, who am I and, and what am I doing? And, and it's the time you try out different things and find what works for you. And then eventually you kind of figure that out and then you'll come into maybe the phase that I'm in right now, which is that I know who I am. I know what I want. I know what I'm doing and I'm doing it. Okay, I'm kind of a place of generativity. But then we get older and there comes a time to slow down and to pass on the mountain. Um, and, and we ask questions like, you know, what are what are your aptitudes and can you develop those into into skills? And can you take a skill and develop it even into a talent? Right? What are what are your interests and, and your passions and what do things like that mean? And how can you kind of use all of those things to, to serve others because you're in a social context where, where your talents are, are useful? Um, well, thank you for your attention. Um, are there any any sort of questions or comments on record? I noticed an error on the slide there. Next lecture is chapter two. All right. 
So I've gone and read chapter two. I read it over the weekend in like one sitting. I rather enjoyed it. And we'll start with chapter two on Wednesday. So please notice the error. It's not chapter one, it's chapter two. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>